and we use appropriate signals, nonverbal signals. One way that you can help children to prepare ahead is by having them create fact files. So if there are certain people that children, children are going to be interacting with regularly, um, you can have them do fact files for those people. So this could be an index card that includes important information about the person on one side, their name, their birth date, as well as you know, information about their family members. And then on the other side, it might have other important information, like their favorite interests and their favorite activities. So another version of this that might be appropriate for younger children is the people file, which you can see here. Um, what happens is children write three facts about themselves on one side and then three corresponding facts about the other person on the other side. So if a child identifies the three important facts about himself are my favorite food is pizza, my favorite video game is Mario Kart, and I like to read Harry Potter books. On the other side, they're going to write down the other person's favorite food, favorite video game, and favorite books. So when the child wants to start a conversation with a particular person, we hope that he or she can recall information from their fact file or their people file to think of questions to ask or comments to make. So children with ASD also can be taught about general topics that can be helpful for starting conversations, and Garcia Winner lists the ones on the top. So remembering shared events. An example is, let's say two children went bowling together. Um, a couple weeks ago, and they had fun. One might start a conversation by saying, hey, remember that time we went bowling? And then hopefully that'll lead to a conversation about that event or similar events. Seasonal topics. Um, those can be helpful for starting conversations. Um, you know, what are you going to do over spring break? Or, I really wish we would have gotten snow this winter so I could have gone sledding. And then we have news events, which we all know can lead to conversations. Now, we probably don't want, you know, kids having intense political discussions because that seems to be what's going on in the news right now. But there are certainly other things they can talk about. Um, I think of the example of the earthquake last year. That certainly sparked a lot of conversation. And you know, Apple just introduced the newest version of the iPod, or, lot, or iPad, excuse me, and a lot of our kids are very interested in, in that. So that could be something we could talk about. Enjoyable personal experiences include things like, you know, books they've read, vacations they've gone on, movies they've seen, and then things we forget about other people. So sometimes we've talked to people, but we forget certain facts about them. Um, so a child might say something like, Oh, I remember that we talked about your family, but I can't remember how many brothers and sisters you have. So Jed Baker approaches teaching starting conversations a little bit differently. Um, and he provides suggestions about the types of questions that we can ask others. So Garcia Winter focuses on comments and questions we can use to start conversations. Um, Baker focuses mainly on questions. So examples of questions about the present. If two children are walking to the gym class together, they might, you know, one might ask the other, what do you think we're doing in the gym class today? Or if they're sitting at lunch together, what do you mean for lunch today? Questions about the past. How was your vacation? Did you do anything fun last weekend? Questions about the future could include, what are you doing after school today? Are you taking any trips this summer? And then, of course, questions about people's interests. Do you like sports? Or have you seen any good movies lately? So if we think back to McAfee's paths, the T stands for time it right. So it's important to teach children that there are appropriate times when we can start conversations with people. We want to make sure that they're not busy and they're not in a hurry. And we also want to teach them that there are certain places where conversations are appropriate. So, you know, sitting in a movie theater while the movie is playing, that's not an appropriate time to start a conversation. But sitting in the movie theater while the lights are still on and we're waiting for the movie to start, that would be an okay time to start a conversation. Or when they're on the playground together, that's an appropriate time, but not while they're in class and the teacher is teaching. Um, so the H stands for hello. We want to teach children that if you haven't already talked to somebody that day, that you want to first greet them. And as I you know, alluded to earlier, teaching them the difference between formal and informal greetings is important. And then finally, we want to use appropriate nonverbal signals during conversations, like smiling, unless, of course, the topic is serious or sad. 
we want to face the other person, we want to have a friendly or interested tone of voice, and we want to look at the person we're talking to. Um, so maintaining conversations and ending conversations are other important aspects of conversations to teach children with ASD. So to maintain conversations, it's important that individuals can provide a variety of conversational responses. So think back to that list that I went over by um, McCaffrey. And it's really important for children to be able to have a variety of questions that they can ask as well as comments that they can make to maintain conversations. And then when teaching children how to end conversations, it's good to teach them that they can first provide a nonverbal cue indicating that they need to leave the conversation before they actually leave. So for example, looking at their watch. Now, we have to often tell them only to do this if they're actually wearing a watch. <laughs> because I had a group where one child continually looked at his wrist to practice this skill, and he wasn't wearing a watch. So, as many of you probably know, we do have to be very specific with children with ASD because they're very good rule followers. Um, so we have to tell them the rules as well as the exceptions to the rules. Another nonverbal cue might be starting to turn away from the group. And then they can make an exit comment, but if they can't get a word in edgewise, they could just give a little wave and step away. So again, these are skills that need to be practiced in role play before they become more natural. So finally, I wanted to give you some suggestions regarding ways that you can help kids practice skills. Jed Baker, in his book, talks a lot about baiting the skill. And this is basically setting up a situation so that a child has to practice a specific skill. Um, so one example is if you're trying to teach a child how to ask questions, you might make a comment that pulls for a question to be asked. So something like, I saw something really cool today. You expect that the child will ask, what was it? So if the child doesn't respond, then again, we're going to use more direct prompts. So, well, do you want to know what it, what it was? And if he or she says yes, then you can say, well, ask me, what was it? Um, another example is teaching children how to interrupt appropriately. So what you can do is give a child all of the materials that they need to do a task, except for one. So let's say they're sitting down to do homework. Um, you'll give them everything except for their pencil. Then what you could do is start a conversation with somebody else, and they have to interrupt in order to get the pencil that you're holding. So if they wait for a pause and say, excuse me, then you can give them the pencil and give them positive feedback for interrupting appropriately. But if they do not interrupt appropriately, then you can teach the skill and have them practice it again. Um, and it's important to give feedback, but one thing I just want to, um, to really um, stress is that it's important to give the feedback in a non-judgmental and non -critical because otherwise children could, you know, just not pay attention to what you're saying or get angry. So it's important to be very calm and neutral um, and also to make learning social skills fun. Um, so that concludes what I have to say. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Cooper who will be talking about social skills in adolescence. Different roles, identities to really try to figure out who they are. That's what they're supposed to be doing. 
there's a shift away from the family as being the main source of information and feedback and a shift to peers. So peers are increasingly becoming the people who provide information, um, offer feedback and critique about your social skills. So um, this is kind of ultimately sets up adults to be less of uh, authority figures and, and people who can give them feedback that they're willing to accept. So this kind of creates some changes, a need for change in how we approach social skills. Um, there's also more of a shift to a co-ed, co heterosexual peer group. You know, uh, boys kind of leave that girls are icky stage. And um, uh, increased interest in romantic relationships. And there is an increased focus on independence and that thinking about becoming an adult. Um, I know that some of the parents that I work with are sort of surprised to think about their teenager, that their teenager might be thinking about these things. But definitely, my experience is that um, all of our adolescents, no matter what their functioning level, they're thinking about becoming an adult. And even if their behavior isn't showing that they're trying to become more independent, um, they know that that's something that they need to be approaching. And a lot of times, they're really terrified. Um, the other big thing to think about is that during adolescence, there is this much higher risk of things like depression and anxiety. <clears throat> In fact, we are learning that anxiety is a very, very major component for kids with autism spectrum disorders. There was a recent, a recent study done by uh, Vasa et al. It actually was uh, here, largely here at our center. And um, it, it really, it was looking at a really large group of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. And not only did we find that kids overall on the autism spectrum have a much higher rate of anxiety disorders, but that teens in particular had a much higher rate. <coughs> Excuse me. In fact, 41% of the adolescents in the sample were found to have a clinically significant anxiety disorder. And just to give you a point of reference, in the general population, we usually see about 9% of anxiety disorders. So this is a really, really big problem for our adolescents. And um, as you might already know, when you are nervous about something, you tend to avoid it. That's what you want to do. Um, so a lot of our teens, by the time we're seeing them, they've had multiple negative experiences socially. Um, they, they've been told repeatedly that what they do isn't right, and so they begin to avoid social interaction. And we often have teens who, frankly, their lives are they go to school and then they come home and they sit in the room all day, and there's really no interaction with the outside world. So as a result, we really end up focusing on that as one of our primary goals, really targeting the anxiety. You know, teaching them how to keep their conversation going is sort of secondary. It's how do we really help them reconnect with <coughs> Sorry, it's allergy season. Mm -hmm. um, I think that groups offer a really unique opportunity to target anxiety. When you think about it, um, what we know about anxiety treatment, one of, the best, one of the best strategies for treating anxiety, is helping people to, to face the thing that makes them scared and kind of stay in the presence of the thing that makes them scared for a long period of time. Well, if you have an anxious teen come to a group, they're by definition spending time with other peers. So that really helps their anxiety in and of itself. The other thing is, you know, our groups are very safe. They're warm. They're sometimes one of the first places that the teens having really positive social experiences with other teens. So that really helps the anxiety quite a bit. I also wanted to do a quick review of two other concepts, executive functioning skills, Executive function refers to the group of mental processes that enable physical, cognitive, and emotional self-control. So what that's saying is there's a part of your brain that helps your, the rest of you, the rest of your brain and your body plan, organize your thinking, your emotions, and your behavior. We know that these skills tend to be areas that are really difficult for our kids on the spectrum. Um, Things like planning a social outing, planning, okay, I met this person, kind of liked them. How am I going to interact with them again? That's really, really hard. Um, I have lots of parents that say, 
yeah, my teenager met so so and so at school, but she can't ever remember to get their phone number. So these little basic things become huge problems. If you never can remember to get the phone number, you're never going to interact with the person outside of school. <coughs> the other uh, concept is adaptive skills. This refers to the social, conceptual, and practical skills necessary for daily living. These are those basic things that we all take for granted. When you go to a restaurant, you know, what do you do to order? What do you do if you need a refill on your drink? How do you pay? How do you figure out the tip? Our teens have a really hard time just knowing this, these basic skills. And as you might imagine, that has huge impact on how much you're going to interact socially. If you can't figure out how to get to a social alley, you're not going to have any interaction. So our adolescent group is called Caucus Connections. It's primarily for, for kids in later adolescence, 15 to 17 or 18 years of age. Uh, it targets teens with average or above average cognitive and language functioning. Um, it's read, currently it's run by a clinical psychologist and a clinical social worker. And it's generally a 14 week group. And really our primary goals are addressing that anxiety and avoidance and targeting this executive function and an adaptive behavior skills to try to get kids to reconnect with the social world. Now, um, because teens sometimes tend to not be too receptive to a lot of direct feedback, um, our group definitely tends to have a more activity-based focus. You heard Sean talk about how there's these different strategies. We really use a lot more activities. So um, while we do some skill teaching, a lot of our group is spent just doing natural activities like playing board game or doing some sort of team uh, team of activity that they have to do together. So they're actually practicing the skills and also just really forcing them to kind of face the things that make them scared. Um, and I think it's important to just talk a little bit about why that direct feedback isn't received so well. I mean, I think in general, we can say a lot of teams aren't so great with direct feedback. It's not received too well, but um, I think our teams especially have trouble with it because I think they tend to be a little more fragile. They've had a lot of negative experiences often, and often they are keenly aware of their differences. So sort of pointing those out and, and really har harboring on the things that they're not doing well tends to be counterproductive. So we try to be more encouraging and just try to get them back out there and trying to reconnect with people. We also um, really try to focus on those executive functioning skills. So part of what we build into our group are a number of field trips where we go into the community and we uh, put increasing levels of responsibility on the teams to plan the, the trips. <coughs> so, uh, for example, we'll give them a, a couple of ideas of things that they could possibly do and then we give them a structure and at the beginning we start off with modeling it and then we put them more and more in charge of actually planning the trip and then also use some task analysis strategies to help them figure out what they're going to do while they're actually on the field trip. And uh, some of the places we've gone before are the aquarium downtown, we've gone to an Italian restaurant for pizza, um, we are thinking about going to a local mall uh, just to kind of get them connected with sort of the real life activities that we would expect our teams to be doing with their peers. And one of the main reasons we use a lot of the activities is because we find that it sort of ups the ante with the anxiety. Um, the kids tend to get more comfortable, you know, they're getting used to coming in, and they get used to us, each other. So they sort of need something that's going to push them a little bit more. So going to a, a place in the community helps them uh, face more of the things that make them anxious. We also think it might improve the generalizability of skills. We've heard a lot about that today, but that can be a real area of difficulty for our kids. So we think by going into real life settings, that might help with that. It also increases motivation. You know, the kids want to go to these places, so they're going to be more motivated to actually apply the skills and practice them. <coughs> Connection also includes some amount of parent 
I don't know if I really want to call it training, it's more parent coaching, where we really help parents think about how they give feedback to their teens. Um, some of those things that we've, I've talked about that we have to do differently in group, we also try to help model and help parents look at that maybe they can't give such direct feedback, but there has to be sort of a shift in their role where they're helping teens access social interaction, but they're not so much critiquing how they're going about doing it. Um, we remind parents to, to use that desire for autonomy and to really help them um, look for ways to help their teens take more responsibility so they can become more independent. <clears throat> we also often encourage parents, and I do some of my individual therapy sessions too, to require that their teen do some sort of social activity. So um, to get away from that, living in their room all by themselves. And this is a great place to use special interests. You know, if your teen really wants to go to an anime club, great. Even if you don't think anime is all that great, at least they're out there interacting with other teens. And then the other thing that we talk a lot about, um, and I, again, in individual therapy, I talk about this as well, is the importance of teaching those adaptive skills and starting early and practicing them a lot. So really putting your team in charge of practicing things like ordering food at a restaurant, paying for food at a restaurant, um, using ATM machine, figuring out how to pump gas. All of that stuff has to often be taught explicitly. <clears throat> so I gave some ideas of things that I sometimes recommend for families to have their team practice doing. And they're often things that you would sort of assume your team would already know how to do. But you might be surprised. Um, our group actually recently went to the Italian restaurant that I mentioned. And I was floored when I saw our teams, who are really competent people, have really a lot of difficulty with things like knowing what to do when their drink got empty. They would come and ask us what they should do. Um, one of the other big stumpers was, do I have enough money to pay for this item? Um, and then when the bill came, they weren't sure what to do with their money. Do I put it in the folder? Do I take it up to the cash register? How does this all work? And you know, these kids have probably been to restaurants with their parents hundreds of times. But they learn these things differently. So, you know, a lot of this has to be taught explicitly, I think, and then again, practiced. And then the other thing, just to spend a minute on, um, we aren't really targeting this in our group yet, but I've been really intrigued by the, the role of social media. Um, when Facebook and things like that came out, me and the autism community <coughs> heard some things about how you know, this is going to be a really great way, we think, for our teens to connect with people because it uses electronics. I mean, you know, people on the, on the autism spectrum really like electronics, and it's a little safer. You can communicate over, over email or Facebook. But actually, we're finding that that's really not happening. Um, just clinically, I've noticed that a lot of my kids, not interested in Facebook, not interested in email, don't know how to use it, even though they're very skilled with the computer. And there was just a study that came out that um, supported this finding. <clears throat> Missouri and colleagues found that in general, kids with autism spectrum dis disorders have much higher rates of usage of electronics. But 64% of them have never used email, chat room, or any kind of social media. And I think that that's important because in, in their generation, this is like one of the main connections. This is how kids make plans, figure out that they're going to you know, meet new people, that this is how they, they have a social world. So I think we have to be thinking about how we're going to better help our teens learn these skills. Okay, and then just finally, we've included some of the resources that we referenced today. Um, I think a lot of these are very parent friendly, so definitely check them out. I think we spend a lot of great strategies. Okay. So I guess we can open open up the floor for questions. For um, a child to participate in one of the groups, do they have to have, I mean, what, if, if you have, say for example, if you have clients that might benefit from the group, how do you go about getting your, um, recommending that to happen? Um, so, uh, most of our kids are actually referred there to a provider here at CARD. So if, if they would already have a provider here, they could certainly speak to them about it. If not, um, the families are welcome to call here and speak to our triage group. Okay. Um, 
for the right group. And what's the cost? Um, our groups are covered by insurance. As private insurance has a reimbursement, we can use insurance. Sound like wonderful uh, groups to be in. And do you have any tips on how to get over sort of the activation energy? Of, we've got a 14 year old to actually you know, buy in and participate in the group. That's a great question. Um, so we, we do do intakes. I didn't speak at all about that process, but we do meet with parents, the, the family and the child before the actual group. We spend a lot of time in thinking about the members of our group, so that's a chance for us to really get to know the kids and figure out. Sort of, does it, can we have a, a group here? Are these people, are these kids really similar? But that's also an opportunity for them to come in, meet us as, as the leaders. Um, we're welcome to show them the space. Sometimes that sort of decreases anxiety. Hear what we're going to do. We work really hard to try to get some buy-in. Um, and often those activities help a lot. We'll collect information about what the person, what the child's interests are, and you know, talk about if there's ways we can incorporate those as the particular activities for our group. Yeah, we, we know buy is important, so we try to, <laughs> to help with that. I'm going to ask a question. You talked about the mishaps that go on in school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you've heard about the groups here. I'm sure you all have parents who have kids who are in social schools 